Okay. Okay, so um, today we'll be talking about 2D arrays. Uh, I hope you guys already studied how a 2D array looks like because uh, today's tutorial is going to be pretty difficult if you guys don't understand the shape of a 2D array. Um, basically, there are three, two parts. First is the matrix. It's an extension of what we studied in lecture. right? Uh, it's an extension of what we studied in lecture. Um, we'll be doing three, four things. Three things like actually. Transpose, uh, multiplication, and determinant, uh, deter determinant. Minor matrix will be used to calculate the determinant. If you do not know the formula, it's okay. We'll be introducing it in this tutorial. So just please pay attention. Also, um, uh, these three things will be, these three parts, right, will be calculated differently. As you can see, like the output for part task one and task two is also another matrix, while the output for task three is just a number. So we'll see how we can actually solve matrix problems. Second, we'll be talking about maze. Uh, first is generating a random maze, and second is uh, checking whether a maze is solvable or not. Uh, please take some time to actually try to understand the question. Lah. Okay. So I think I'll skip. Uh, if I cannot finish the uh, like, tutorial in time, just uh, I beg your pardon. Lah. But then uh, I'll try to finish it on time. Okay. So, um, We'll start with a little review of, of a multi-dimensional array. So this is, again, like a multi-dimensional arrays can be in any dimensions. I think we have talked in lecture. Uh, uh, we have a 1D array, which is our, the standard array that we learned. A 2D array, where we have an array inside another array, where the array inside can represent the columns or the rows and lastly is the 3d arrays so i think for a visual representation I, I think i'll use this visual representation best that maybe some of you can relate with so the i think as you can guess the picture above is an actually a 1d array one dimension array where you just have a list of in this case people standing next to each other this is index 0 1 2 3 4 5 while the ones on the bottom is index is you know like you know there's rows and columns of people so you can know that this is like zero 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 one zero two zero three and then there's an array of people forming rows and columns and you want to find a person inside this group of people you can simply call the index say like zero one or seven ten and it will look at uh, row seven and then uh, column ten which is not here Okay, so um, next is for 3D, I think this is a very good example where I think this one is also touched on lecture where yeah, the on a 2D array, it's basically a, a group of pixels, but then pixels itself can be split into three channels, which is the R, the G, and B, as each color in each pixel is a combination of three, three, these three colors with different proportions. Okay. So this is the actual, like the look of a multi-dimensional array in Python. So this one is actually the representation that is being used in lecture, where you have rows and columns and the rows represent the columns. Eh, sorry, the row is the X and the columns are the ones inside. So you can see that there's uh, the row number zero, row number one, and this is the columns. This is column zero, this is column one, this is column two, and so on and so on. Right. Um, so to access it, you can simply just access the row first and then you access the column. Okay. So there is another representation which is less common, which is basically the other way around, where you actually create the columns first, and then inside the column is basically your rows. Okay. So 
Now, uh, the question is like, which one, which representation should we use? Uh? With the roll call or the call row? Now, the answer is actually up to you. It really depends on, it really depends on situation. Uh. I mean, in CS 1010E, we will think mostly use roll call, but there's nothing that's stopping you using a call row. As mentioned, two, two dimensional arrays, right, are more of a, way of writing things it's not really a thing inside python but then it's just a data structure that is very useful and very common and we see it everywhere every in everyday lives lah. so that's why we have we learn these things called uh, multi-dimensional arrays in, you know like a spreadsheet or as we can see earlier so generally to um to access the values in an array uh we use a uh, nested loop where we have two for loops right um, as you can see this is the box pointer diagram that we have that we usually see in python tutor so whether depending on whether your x is your rows or columns in this case it's a row so like you know this is first sec, row zero row one row two row three and then this is call zero call one call two call three call four we iterate one by one, so we iterate start. We always start from x zero, and then we go through the value one by one. You know, from zero, one, two, three, four, and then we go to the next row. The loop, the iteration inside the loop inside is basically the zero one. Going through the actual values inside, this one only iterates through the rows. So to access it, you do just list x y. So, okay, so far, are there any questions? If there are any questions, if there are no questions, thumbs up on the review. Hello. Are there any other questions? Uh, examples for call row. Um, what do you mean by examples? Uh? Like a uh, row call or call row is just a matter of representation. It's just the way we represent our data structure. But the way the way we solve problems right, will have nothing to do with row call or call row. It has nothing to do with it. Okay. Okay, anything else? If not, I'll just move forward. Okay. So we have part one matrix. Um, you can represent a matrix by a list of lists, remember? So in CS1010E, we do a row call. So in this way, if we want to access like row one, call two, right? We basically do like M1, sorry, I cannot annotate column okay yeah let me try to end it if possible so if you want to access this say this thing over here we would do like m okay, let me, uh, m one eh, sorry m yeah one And then it's at call to M1 alone. M1 alone will actually return this particular row. Oops. And then like after returning that row for M1, for M1, right, it will, this thing will actually take the second index, like, which is one here. Okay. So now um, we have matrix exercises, so we can assume that all the entries are integers. Um, so there are functions that have been provided in lecture. Okay, so there has been functions that are provided in lecture, such as create zero matrix and m type print. I hope you guys are familiar. In the case where you guys are not familiar, this is the function. So we have identity matrix, m type print, create zero matrix, create random matrix, and some matrices. If you don't know it yet, 
feel free to open the file. It's in Cosmology, download it. It's going to be useful in our tutorial today. So there may be a lot of code online, but you may want to try it by yourself. And the package NumPy does actually provide all the functions that we are going to create today. But we just want to learn uh, so we can actually understand more how to de arrays work. Okay. So our first task today, for today is actually to create a transpose. Now transpose is, uh, you know, you just like shift, you just rotate things around so that the rows becomes the columns and the columns becomes the rows, okay? So given, say we have this array, we're gonna transpose it this way, okay? So, uh, for those of you who don't know transpose, you know, the internet is uh, there's a lot of wiki how to function. Okay, so, um, oh shit, my internet connection is unstable, is it? Oh no. I think this looks bad. Okay. Um, no, no worries. If if say this uh, this uh, tutorial looks bad, uh, you guys can go watch the other tutorial recordings. Oh yeah, by the way, my internet is restored. I want to try. Can you just give me a moment to shift to NUSSTU so I don't keep on consuming my mobile data? Meanwhile, you guys can try it on your own on how to transpose. Okay? It's not that hard. So you guys can try it on your own. If you guys are confused, you can look at Wiki how. Uh, give me like three minutes. Less okay. Uh, right, internet connection is restored. I'm glad. Um, now let's try to do this. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, we have this and uh, okay. Okay. Uh, oh, this was from earlier. Okay. So we. Okay. So we can start with any, uh, okay, if we read Wikihow, right, the way we transpose is actually, uh, we start with any matrix and then we start with the first row and then we shift the first row into the columns and then you repeat for the remaining rows, shift it to the columns. In fact, uh, it's, this, it's the same for non-square matrix. And then lastly, like, you want, uh, there's a mathem mathematical notation for that. So in this case, we know that if matrix P is an M and M times N matrix, then the transpose results is an N times M matrix. And I think the most important thing is in the last line here. For each element in P, X, Y, X row, Y column, the matrix P, T has an equal element at P, Y, X. So I think let's try to code that. Def transpose tricks so what we want to do here is want to somewhat iterate through the uh, we want to iterate through the call uh, items so for R in row
we know that here like matrix BT, the, the matrix transpose, so like uh, the new the new matrix or transpose matrix. As uh, row column is equals to the matrix, but the row and column says swap up. Okay. We know that. Or in other words, we can also do this uh, row. Uh, column, column, row. The reason is because later on, right, like uh, we want to iterate through the, you know, we need to iterate through the range of row and column. And to iterate through the range of row and column, we need to get the length of the row and the column. So it depends on which rows and columns you are iterating through. If you iterate through the rows and columns of um, the matrix itself, then the the, the we should follow this uh, notation la, row column. So in this case, I hope you guys understand la. Uh, it's uh, it's a bit confusing. It's something like this. Okay. Another alternative is. You know, earlier remember when I do this, uh, when the row column is actually at the transpose matrix instead of the matrix itself. This is only correct if the row column uh, arrange, uh, the length, if we actually use the transpose one, if the length, if we use the length of the transpose matrix. Something like this. So now uh, we know that uh, the, with, with this formula, we are actually shifting it one by one. And if you don't believe it, you can try it yourself. But then we have, sorry, we have a matrix that is actually, we have a matrix that has not been defined before. So we kind of want to define that first. Now in this case, we want to reuse a function that I've been defined in lecture. Just create zero matrix. Create zero matrix serves as, you know, like the boxes that stores our numbers. You can do this. But then we know that in from the first line, right, if matrix B is an M times N matrix, then the transpose matrix is actually the opposite, but it's N times M. So what we want to do here is, is actually we want to just reverse it up. Yes. So in this case, for the bottom part, the implementation will be something like this. We can, uh, we can replace this. This we just replace the variables. So yeah, there are two different implementations depending. The first implementation iterates through the original matrix, so it goes through the value of the items in the original matrix. While the second one, it trades through the values of the empty transpose matrix. Now, once we're done transferring the values from the original matrix to the transpose matrix, we simply return the transpose matrix. Okay. Are there any questions? I know it's a bit confusing. So that's why if you are confused, please ask questions. Yes, Vaisha, do you have any questions? Or oh, none? Okay. The rest, do you have questions? 
Okay, none. Okay, then transposing should be pretty easy. We're moving on to the next part. The next question is uh, matrix multiplication. Okay, now my question is, uh, okay, now I need you guys to open reactions in your Zoom. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you know how to multiply a matrix. If you know how to multiply a matrix and give me a clap if you don't know. If you don't know, clap. If you know, thumbs up. Okay, there's two people clapping. There's two, three people giving a thumbs up. Okay. So uh, I think a majority of this class knows how to multiply. Okay. And teacher is just like having a party. Okay, sure. So okay, uh, we'll go to uh, matrix multiplication. Given two matrices, compute. Uh, okay, so given two matrices A and B, compute the multiplied matrix C A B, such that uh, this is the formula la. So I think some things that we need to uh, pay attention here is actually uh, uh, there's some characteristics of a matrix multiplication. For example, we know that uh, matrix A is an M times N matrix and B is an N times P matrix. And for a multiplication to take place, right, for, you know, cross-pollination to take place, um, both A should have N columns, B should have N rows, meaning that the columns of A should have equal length with the row, number of rows in B. Okay? So, I think that's the first criteria that we want to write. Uh, that uh, say we have matrix A, matrix B, if the row A is not equal to, eh, sorry, call A, right, call A is not uh, equal to the number of row B, then uh, return false because you cannot multiply it. Maybe here you can print a statement like uh, cannot multiply le. Okay. Yeah, so we got that part up, right? So we've checked that, but then we don't know what's the length of call. A and row B. So like maybe we want to do that first. Row A, call A, row B, call B. We want to define this first. And row A is defined by length of matrix A. The column A is defined by the length of the item inside matrix A. If you guys remember the data structure of a multi-dimensional, uh, of a 2D matrix, this should be, you guys should have understood this. Maybe I want to make it a little bit fun. I don't want it to be zero. I just want it to be minus one. And that's perfectly fine. Okay. So after we check that both are multipliable, now let's check out the formula. So the formula is that uh, for every CIJ, right, uh, it is a sigma of AIK times KJ sigma. K is an iteration from K to N. And I and J, it depends on the position on C, which is the answer matrix. 
So I think in this case, right, the easiest way is actually to iterate through the items inside the C matrix. So first, let's create that C matrix, which is create zero matrix. Now remember, the zero matrix here is M and P, is M times P. And what's the value of M? If you remember, M is actually the num the length, the num the M is the number of rows in A. So row A is M. And P is actually that's my mouse. That's my cursor. Uh, P is you remember is the number of columns in B. So call B. Right. So we create that. M P. Right. Now uh, it's easy. We iterate through the rows and columns in C, in which the length of row C is M and the column of row C is P. We do a double loop as usual. Now, so the value of C at position R and okay, actually I won't use R and C, I would use I and J at position I IJ, right, is a sigma of A I K times B K J. You guys are following, right? The sum of this sum, sum, and if we know how to sum the, uh, and then the value of K iterates from one to n. But then we don't have M yet. So our I in range 1 to N plus 1, because we want to include N. We want to have C, I, J plus all of these values. Right, this is the formula, but then we don't have the value of n, but n is actually the value of uh, n call, call columns of a, so we're just gonna put that up, which is actually the same as row b as well, but we just need to send one value, so that's up. Now we have defined n, then I think everything is good. Or this one should be k. So. Now, this one, now to describe, so if you can see, uh, where's my cursor? Okay. You can see this one, this iterates through the matrix C, one by one, C11, C12, C13, and at each particular box, we do the sigma sum here. Another alternative is, as we know that this is sigma, we can do like sum, a, I, K, B, K, J for K in range 1 and plus 1 using list comprehension. Okay. Once you calculated the multiplication, you simply return the matrix. And that's for math, math, uh, math Okay. Are there any questions? Any questions, guys? If there are no questions, maybe thumbs up. You guys understand, right, how I come up with the code, right? Uh, like, for those of you who just, you know, come here, never do tutorial before, and just, like, see how I come up with the code. 
you guys understand right just say in the zoom chat that oh yeah i understand so i and i know that you guys actually understand all right okay great 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 okay uh okay thanks all right thank you so much thank you so much for the response uh i'm, I'm just scared that i go too fast because it can get quite overwhelming okay so that's for mathematical uh, multiplying matrices so yeah this um the difference between uh, transpose and mathmal is that for transpose right we see here we try to for we iterate through the first matrix the original matrix and we try to fill it up in the new matrix in this case for mathmal it's easier for us to iterate through the final matrix because there's a formula that connects the final matrix with the original two matrix matrices especially when the input there are, the input has multiple matrices which is difficult to iterate so it's better to iterate through the final matrix all right um next question Ah, this one is. The next question is minor matrix. Uh, so, minor matrix isn't really a thing in in math. It's not really a thing. But then, uh, minor matrix is going to be very useful in our question task four in counting determinants because in counting determinants you kind of need to get the value of minor these so-called minor matrices. So let's try to. Um, So let's try to figure out uh, how to get the minor matrices. So minor matrices are defined like um, the matrices that is with the without row i and column j. So with this one, we remove this column, we remove this column, and we get that column. Okay. So for this one, um, it's you guys can actually like iterate through the rows and columns one by one, but actually it's pretty straightforward. Whenever we want to remove stuff from the list, what we can do is basically do a list slicing like this. Okay, I'm guess so. This is the code. I'm gonna give you guys like thirty seconds of silence for you guys to try to understand the code before I explain. Um, 30 seconds has up. Someone asked for to go back on the previous slide on the minor matrix. Okay, minor matrix basically the def definition is you just remove uh, the row I and column J. That's all. Just remove row I and column J. Okay. So I think for here, like I think uh, this one, this part over here slices the row. So basically this one remove the row that you want to remove. See like if you can see like I is excluded here and I is skipped over here. Okay. In this case, after I remove the row, I iterate through them one by one. And for every row, right, I remove the column J, right. It's excluded, it's excluded. So I hope that uh, explains uh, how the minor matrix works. So in this case, uh, it's very simple. Like, you don't really do a very complicated loop. You just look through the rows and make edits on each row. Okay? Okay, so now uh, we have done my minor matrix, right? 
keep this in mind. Uh, we're going to go to the task four determinant, which is calculating the determinant of a matrix. Okay. So we have some assumptions. We assume that the matrix is a square. Because if it's not a square, then we're going to die in calculating it. <laughs> okay. So no matter how the big the matrix is, uh, there's a one recursive formula to do it. You take the element of the first row and find the determinants of all the all the minor matrices. Okay, so for example, we take the first row here, and then like we iterate through the first row, and then for each item in the first row, which will multiply it with the determinant of the minor matrix. Right. So in this case, like this. Moreover, what's uh, just ignore the signs first. Just ignore the signs first. I know they are alternating. We'll touch on that later. But I want you guys to focus on this part over here first, like iterating through this. So it means that given, say, I have a, Yeah, I think my pen just died. Let me check. Didn't die though. So in the case like, uh, hmm. Okay. So in this case of a matrix, a uh, four times four matrix, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, and O, P, right? The determinant of this matrix will be um, A times the determinant of F, G, H, J, K, L, and N, O, P minus B, E, G, H, I, K, L, M, O, P plus C of E, F, H, I, J, L, M, N, P, minus D, E, F, G, I, J, K, M, N, O. So you kind of get the gist of it. Lah. You take one and then you remove the rest. You take, you take one, you remove the rest. You take one and you remove the rest and you take the determinant. So, we know that we kind of need to iterate through, iterate through the first row, right? So that's what we're going to do. Lah. Um, we're going to iterate through the first row. Where is it? Say we have... Uh, Left that matrix. So, um, oops. Sorry, it's very hard to find my mouse. Okay, so uh, we have matrix, right? Uh, we figure out the length of the row. Length of the row first. The, the size of the matrix because we know right it's a square matrix right so it means the row and the, the row and the column should have the same length so we'll just do a length matrix here right then we iterate for one by one for i uh, in range size right so now we gonna say go since we take only the first row, right? So for now, we want to take the uh, items of the first row by actually. So the item will be a uh, matrix. Since it's in the first row, we'll do row zero. It can be a constant, and then basically, as it uh, iterates, it will go one by one through the columns, which is represented by i. So we know the item. And then the item must be multiplied by the minor matrix. So we use the function that we made earlier. 
matrix I right oh we're gonna the, since the row is zero we're gonna put zero as row and the row is I depending on the position of the item that we take now the thing is we don't multiply item with this particular matrix but we multiply it with the determinant of the matrix And if you pay attention, this becomes a recursive formula. As you know, it creates a smaller matrix and then like the smaller matrix, uh, you know, you count the determinant, find a more smaller matrix and keep on getting smaller. Hence, we kind of need a base case. And the base case is actually a, a matrix of the size two. If you don't know, it's okay. So, um, so here's the thing. Uh, when the matrix is at size two, right? The formula is is uh, this thing multiplied by this thing. Okay. This multiplied by this minus this multiplied by this. This this this. Oh my god. So in this case, e times i minus f times h, d times i minus f times g. So that's the key. That's the determinant when you uh, have a matrix of size two. So we're gonna define that. If size is two, then the determinant of that particular matrix is return times matrix one minus matrix zero one. matrix one zero else this is what happens matrix zero one else the answer is zero we'll start with zero remember it's a summation of things uh, then uh, basically uh, answer equals to the answer plus the item times the determinant. And finally, you can return answer. Now we have now lastly we haven't figured out like how to make the negative sign alternates. And for this if you don't know it's okay but if you know then it's great. So uh, basically right uh, just the formula is to create something like that is minus one to the power of i. How so? If you see right uh, at column zero, column zero right, minus one to the power of zero is one. Anything to the power of zero is one. So in this case, it's gonna be positive. One times everything right is just gonna be positive. Next when at column B, which is column one, minus one to the power of one is minus one. That's minus one times the entire uh, uh, item here is gonna be negative this, so it's gonna negate it, and it's gonna be keep on vice versa sign all the time. Okay, so during odd odd power odd powers is gonna be negative. During even powers is gonna be positive. So when you want to do an alternate of signs, this is your formula, like minus one to the power of the iterator. Okay, so that's how you actually calculate the determinant of a matrix. Mm, no. Uh, what if i is two? I equals to two. The negative will be positive, right? Because it's gonna be squared. okay it's okay it's not your bad like we are learning this together everyone here is learning this module together so like it's okay to make mistakes 
Okay, any other questions regarding the matrix multiplications? I think this one is another interesting part, right? Because this one is a little bit hard coded because you kind of know that the, the thing that you need to iterate is only the first row. So that's why it's slightly hard coded. Lah. You can see it's a bit hard coded here. We don't really iterate through the, the boxes one by one. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, is this slide on cosmology? Um, some are. Yeah, I mean, you can you can see la, like those slides that have okay, like my earlier slides, like uh, like my earlier slides on this one. These are not on cosmology. Like the one that are these that has a background. These are not on cosmology. But the ones that are on white, they are on cosmology. I know, like, they don't provide you the formula. La. Okay, so if you guys, are, so this is another example. This is the code that they give. La. Okay. Okay, for. So this is an extra question that I, that is not on cosmology as well. So you remember the extra from PE, right? You guys are required to calculate the you guys are required to calculate the area of white, yellow, and red. Now your challenge is to create a 2D matrix where inside the 2D matrix is the area of each box given the list and the height, the list of height and weight width of each. I'm gonna send a question on to, to the telegram so you guys can actually read it now. Uh, read it and try it on your own time if you guys are interested. This one is another good example of 2D matrices. Okay, um, let's have a two minutes break. I'm a little bit out of breath. So um, let's have a two minutes break. Uh, you guys can do whatever you guys want. Lah. Okay. Let's start again. Okay, so we're done with part one of the matrices. Um, okay, I've received, I think, one of the PAs from another tutorial group mentions that you guys cannot, you guys do not really appreciate linear algebra because some of you might not have taken matrices before or linear algebra, and that's perfectly fine. At least you get to get, get a heads up. But yeah, this is quite important actually. This is quite important. In a lot of fields, especially when you are already dealing with like um, machine learning, computer vision, artificial intelligence, these kinds of very cheap stuff, right? When data is just so abundant, these kinds of calculations are very, very important. So having a good understanding on how they work can actually really help you. Okay. So now next we'll go to the next part of the, this tutorial in the last half an hour. We'll be talking about the maze. Okay, uh, yeah, I know the prof is a bit cheesy la, with all the pictures. So yeah, uh, we have a maze, uh, which is an n times m grid, such as when uh, zero is empty and the uh, one is blocked. La. Okay. Yes, one is blocked. So we can generate a maze with half and half chance of empty or block. M type print maze. So the assignment is to create, write a function, create random maze to generate such a maze. Okay. So for task one, right, I'm not gonna really explain a lot. I, I feel, I, I think it should have been explained in lecture before. So in fact, this is a function that is from lecture on creating matrices. So I think I'm gonna adopt it from create random matrix here from lecture. So if you guys uh, don't, I'm not so sure whether they explain it on lecture or not, but I'm going to adopt that either way. So I'm going to take this create random matrix here. Looks like what I need. It creates a, a random matrix that I want for me. Then next, like the random matrix, right? I want it just to like randomize between either zero or one. So let's try to understand the code better. Create random matrix, we have output, which is the original structure of the list. This list will 
store, store the rows and we can see that this R is basically iterating through the rows one by one. See row, and then now it tries to create the values for the columns. And we can see it's row.append rand integer between zero to nine. Oh no, that's what what's that's what we don't want. We don't want to randomize from zero to nine, right? We just want between zero and one. So simply I just changed this particular character. Uh, mark this has changed. So you guys know that that is the part that I changed. After I finish randomize my rows, I'll append the row to the my original matrix, and then I'll just create a new row. Once I'm done, I'll create output. This seems good. Now I rename this as create random maze. Done. We have created a random maze already. Okay. On how we create a random maze, I believe I have asked you guys to actually study it on your own time, how to create a maze, a random matrix. So yeah, I will not delve, go deep into that. Now the tough part is actually on task two. Task one is very easy, right? Like within 30 seconds, we are able to finish it. Now the next part is actually the difficult part, solving the maze. So a maze is solvable if we can go from zero to n minus one, n minus one, basically the end point. Lah. We can do that by through this path, right? Like we can travel, we travel, travel, travel and go to the bottom part and we arrive, okay? So that's, uh, if it's solvable, uh, we, can we can connect them two points. And remember, we cannot do crosses. We can only like go like front, back, left, and right. And it is not solvable uh, if uh, we cannot grow from zero to n minus one. So in this case, you, you can see there's a uh, walls of ones. This wall of ones actually blocks uh, you from traveling till the end, okay? And hence from point zero, these are all the places that you can actually visit, okay? You cannot visit beyond. So now the question is, how do we check whether we can go from the start point to the end point? Any ideas? Okay, for this, please write your ideas in the Zoom chat. It doesn't have to be in Python code, just like, how do you think you can check, like, between like, the start point and the end point is actually connected? Hmm, nice, uh, interesting recursion. What do you exactly recurse though? You check for zero for side by side and top bottom. Recurse if there's possible paths. Uh, I still cannot, I think it's possible, but I still cannot imagine the code implementation in my head. Any other solution? Check three consecutive columns for one. Um, three consecutive columns. What three consecutive columns are, by the way? I'm not so sure why. I mean, technically, right, technically you can have, you know, uh, say the ones, right, you can technically have the ones like, uh, like this, um, you know, it's just like slices through the maze, and then if all of these are one, then it's blocked. Backtracking, wow, backtracking is a, is more, it's a bit difficult. I mean, it's possible, but it's correct, but it's not the algorithm that we're striving for today because it's a bit difficult. If not, check the column below, guys. Basically, what you want to do is basically you want to just anyhow. Okay, la, thanks for the answers. Thanks for the answers, guys. Uh, at least it is a mental exercise for your brain. But basically, the answer is you just want to anyhow go. You just want to anyhow go. Remember earlier here, right? You want to check. Uh, here, this place, right? Um, 
Okay, damn it. Um, you you cannot achieve here to here because it's not reachable. But then, like, if you are asked like between this point and this point, right? Is it? Can you solve it? Then yeah, it's solve it because you can reach it. Meaning that you basically need to find all possible points that the point, the start point can reach. So. Then with that, I want to take us a little, for a little detour to my little trip to Bali, okay? Um, I'll be introducing what we call as the flooding algorithm. And for those of you who want to go for a little bit more advanced, you guys can search for breath or depth first search. Okay? Andy, when you mentioned backtracking, it's not wrong. It's, but it's quite advanced, which is not really needed for this problem. But then it's a very good uh, algorithm that is very useful in like uh, graph search. Now um, I think let's take a little break. Let's have uh, you know like some fun stuff. I want to share a little bit story of my about my trip. So you guys are not. So it's this tutorial is not all about coding. So <laughs> um, yeah, this was me um, back in January twenty twenty pre pandemic. You know, so happy. These were the times when I woke up on my phone and the first news that popped up was not the pandemic, but it was Trump want to bomb the hell out of Iran. So I really love Bali so much. It's one of my favorite places. So I'm going to use Bali as an example for uh, explaining the flooding algorithm to solve our problem. So yeah, the picture, of this, these are pictures of me with my sister. Uh, the above was with me and with my sister in Chimbaran. Chimbaran is the beach where you get to eat grilled seafood, grilled like uh, fresh seafood on the beach itself. So like really like what's under your table is sand. And the picture on the bottom is me at Kuta Beach. It's wonderful. So yeah, um, I do hope that you guys can, you know, like because of this pandemic, uh, this uh, you know exercise can actually help you your mind travel. So now let us travel to uh, uh, Bali. Because of the pandemic, uh, I really want to go all to all the places available in Bali. So these are all the places in Bali represented by a red dot. We have the West National, West Bali National Park, Lovina, Gitgit, Pura Brantan, Gunut Bolong, Ubud, Mount Agung, uh, Kuta, Balangan Beach, Nusa Dua, and Nusta Penida. Um, so we just had, we flew from Changi Airport to the, the Ngurah Rai International Airport at Denpasar. So we're currently at the airport and uh, we don't know what other places available in Bali. But from Denpasar Airport, what I am able to see is the things that are around me. So from Denpasar Airport, I am connected with Gunut Bolong, Ubud, and Kuta. I'm connected with these three places. These are what is so-called neighbors. So I'm connected with these three places. So I'm going to add them to my bucket list. Okay. I'm going to add them to my bucket list. Uh, I uh, visited them. No, sorry. I'm going to add them to my bucket list to visit. So after I'm done with them, pasta, now I take one item from my bucket list, which, and then I go there. I take Kuta Beach, uh, I go there. Now at Kuta Beach itself, um, I get to see three places as my neighbors, Tenpasa, Balangan Beach, and Nusa Dua. But then like I have visited Tenpasa before. So now I don't need to add Tenpasa to bucket, my bucket list. I just need to add uh, Balangan Beach and Nusa Dua to my bucket list. Okay. After, okay, now I've played at the beach, I've showered, I'm ready to move on. I'll take another item on my bucket list, which is Nusa Dua. Ooh, Nusa Dua, one, which have wonderful beaches and good food. Now at Nusa Dua, I've seen Kuta and Balan Beach as my neighbors. But then like, I have visited Kuta and Balan Beach itself is already on my bucket list. I don't need to visit them again. So there's no changes to my bucket list and visited. I'm traveling to Balangan Beach now. Uh, at Balangan Beach, nothing happened. Uh, my neighbors are Kuta and Nusa Dua, but since they are already on my bucket list and visited, 
I'm not adding them. Right, it's done. Now I'm done exploring the south. Uh, I, there's nowhere else to go. So it's time to take another place from the bucket list, which is next is Ubud. Take Ubud, which the neighbors are Purut Polong, Pura, Pura Brantan, and Mount Agung. But Purut Polong is already on the bucket list. So I just add what's not on there. I take another place, which is Mount Agung. Mount Agung has no neighbors. It's very secluded on the eastern side of the island. I visit, I added that to my visit place. I'll take Pura Prantan. It has three neighbors again, Punut Bolong, West Bali National Park, and Git Git. Uh, but then Punut Bolong is already on my bucket list. I don't need to add that again. Git Git has neighbors of, has three neighbors, uh, West Bali National Park, Lovina, and Pura Prantan. But then I visited Pura Prantan before. The National Park is already on my bucket list. Uh, go to Lovina. Lovina is ordered. I add Lovina to my bucket list. Then I visited Lovina. I visited West Bali National Park. And I finally visited Punut Bolong. And hence, I've traveled to all the places in Bali that I can reach with my car. Okay. So that's how the flooding algorithm works. Okay. You keep track of your current position, current location. Right. You start with something current location and then from that current location you add all your neighbors to your bucket list so this is a second list that you need to maintain which is kind of your bucket list and lastly is your visited places this list is important to keep track of the places that you have visited before okay so yeah, uh, we have like one play, one thing to track location and two lists to track your bucket list and your visited location. Now, you guys may be wondering how this may relate to the maze question. This is how we make it relevant. The maze question asks, right, can I go from the stop part to the bottom part, right? Same as this map. From then past our airport where we landed from Chang uh, when we landed from our plane, right? Can we actually go to Kuta Beach? Kuta Beach is in fact adjacent to Denpasar Airport. So we can actually. In fact, this is... And the next question is from Denpasar Airport. Can I visit West Bali National Park? Yes, we can visit West Bali National Park because it is somewhat connected. It, we actually, it is, and the proof that it is connected is because we, when we try to just visit all the possible places, we actually managed to visit it in our visited list. Okay, so, but the question is, can from Denpasar Airport, can I go to Nusa Penida, which is right over here, the small island? And the answer is no, because it's not connected. It is blocked by the waters here, the blue waters. So, uh, in uh, what is the story here? When we see this map over earlier here, right? Uh, then Pasar Airport is like the green point over here. And all the places that we visited earlier are basically all the zeros that are indicated in red. And Nusa Penida is basically the green point over here. And the ones right are basically the blues. Are, are the sea that separates the land and other lands. So yeah, that's on solving the maze. So knowing that uh, we can actually track, we can actually know whether a place is visitable or not by actually like just trying to visit all the places that you can visit, then we'll try to do that. So first, if you are already in a certain position, uh, uh, you want to know where can you go, right? Like this, right? When you are in the past, you want to figure out where are the places you can go. So in this map, you kind of need to figure out where are the places you can go, right? The places you can go are, of course, the places that are indicated by zero. So you cannot, you cannot just go top, bottom, left, and right. You, you cannot go. There are two possibilities that you cannot go. First is that if it's blocked like this, and second if it's out of bounds. Now, how to define this is basically a. Uh, Mm. Yes. 
So, um, okay, so this is the exam uh, example rule. Uh, if you, if the item, if the coordinate, right, the coordinate is one, or then the coordinate does not make sense or it's not valid, then you cannot go there. Ma. So then uh, you kind of want to write a function of possible neighbors that returns a list of uh, neighbor coordinates such that they are possible. So in, in this case, when I enter 2, 2, 9, uh, 2 and 29 over here, the, possibles are, the possible neighbors are 1, 29, or 3, 29. Okay. So after you get all the possible neighbors, right? Um, right, this is the function of all possible neighbors. Okay, so um, yeah, this one. Um, this one checks if it's the coordinates valid or not, and this checks if coordinate is valid, is it blocked or not? Okay. Once you're done with actually figuring out all the neighbors, you know the procedure after you figure out all the neighbors, add them to your bucket list. Okay. So remember what bucket? So first uh, we have visited. Visited is basically your history. I'll recall all the positions that you visited before. And S is basically all the neighbors that we want to try. So S here is your bucket list in a sense. So while S, meaning that while the bucket list is not empty, meaning that you still have places to go, places that you want to explore in this entire whole universe, you take one item from the, you take one place for the S from your bucket list and basically use that as your point of reference, uh, your location. Now you check. Is your location is the your intended destination? Do you really want to visit this place? And if it is true, then you return true, meaning that it is solvable, meaning that you have actually visited that place. Now if it's not, you get the possible neighbors, and then basically you add the possible neighbors to your bucket list. Now, this code has a slightly different implementation. If you pay attention here, even places that you haven't visited before, you just added it to visit it. Now, that is okay because the reason being is that you know that eventually, eventually, that place will be visited through SBOP so that you can just simply uh, safely add all the possible neighbors in the list of visited places because eventually we'll visit them later on. Okay? So in the case, if you want to do keep it the same way as my earlier implementation, you just need to make sure that new pause is not in both visited and a bucket list, which is S. Okay. Okay. So that's that's it. Once you're done. So like say you have visited all your bucket list, right? You have exhausted all your bucket list and you can you still cannot find that place that you really want to go to, right? It means that the iteration ends. The looping here should end. The while loop should have ended. And after you've tried every possible move, there's no more new neighbors you can try. There's no places that you can go to. Basically, it means that you know that it's not solvable, then you simply return false. Okay? This is the way you actually uh, debug it by actually doing print statements. Okay. So we'll do a sample run with the code that we just wrote. Uh, we start at zero, right? Position zero. So the neighbor, the only possible neighbors are zero, one. So this is the list, of our bucket list is zero, one. And then we go to the, we take one item from the bucket list, which is zero, 01 now. And then from zero, 01, we take all possible neighbors, 11 one and zero, 00, which is these two points. But then we have uh, gone through zero, 00 before. So we'll don't add that at our uh, bucket list and we'll just take 11 one instead. 
Now we go for one one. We go for one one, right? And it says the possible neighbors. We visited zero one before, so we don't visit that anymore. Two one at two one here. There are three possible neighbors, top, left, and right. In this case, top has been visited, but left and right hasn't. So we'll add left and right to our bucket list. And then we take one, two, two. Yeah, and we keep on moving, keep on taking one. Okay. So the idea of flooding algorithm is basically you just expand the neighborhood. You just want to keep on visiting, but then you don't want to repeat the places that you have visited because if not, you kind of can get stuck in an infinite regression error. Infinite regression. So lastly is uh, basically a uh, extra challenge is that uh, write a simple loop to find a maze that is solvable. Um, you need to visualize the path and you need to find the shortest path. Uh, and if possible, you find the shortest path as well. Okay. So that's all about flooding algorithms. And there's a reason why it's it actually has a name, flooding algorithm, because um, yes, there's a lot of problems, infinite problems in this world, but most of the problems, right, can be uh, solved by a set of pre, pre, you know, template algorithms, meaning that some of the problems have similar solutions. And usually those similar solutions are grouped into what we call algorithms, predefined algorithms. In this case, this is one of them. This is flooding algorithms. I think when you guys did a sorting assignment uh, on assignment three, you guys maybe like look it up on how to sort without actually sorting. And you guys perhaps through the process learned about bubble sort, binary sort, uh, merge sort, all these different sorts. Those are algorithms because there's a pre already a well-defined set of steps. Say with flooding algorithms, there's a well-defined set of steps that is taken to do flooding algorithms. With the challenge, it might, you might need to modify it a bit. And in the future, you'll be learning more on more algorithms as we go along. The sets of steps that you need to do to solve a problem. Okay. So with that is the end for Maze. Any question for Maze before we end this week's this week's tutorial? Okay, uh, you can walk through the code again. Oh, I was being too fast, is it? Sorry. Yeah, a bit fast. Oops, my bad. So, uh, no, I think I just put it here. I think uh, maybe like you guys like just spend like one minute to read through the code first and try to understand and then I'll go through it again. Okay, I think one minute has passed. So again, um, 
the top part here is just checking lah whether your starting position itself is blocked or not. Because if the starting position is blocked, then uh, pretty useless lah. Okay. Then um, visited is the places that you have visited before. S is your bucket list of the places that you want to go. And per pause position at pause is actually our original position. If you can, if you actually see in this part, right? Uh, this one, we remember we have our bucket list, we have our visited places, and we have our current location. Okay, we have these three different things. Okay, so uh, at this point, at this position, you want to check whether the position is your intended destination or not. In this case, if it's yes, then we just return true. If it's not, then we need to keep on searching. Now I'm already at a particular position. I need to find all the possible neighbors, which is um, already uh, defined here, possible neighbors. This one, you don't really need to worry but the implementation, just trust that possible neighbors will return you the list of possible neighbors that you can go from your current coordinate opposition. Right. And then for every new position, for every new position or new neighbors, it puts on the neighbor list, possible neighbors. Now you check whether that new you have visited the new position already or whether you are going to visit it or not. If you have visited it or not, or going to visit it, then you don't need to add it anymore. This is going to create a double. And if it's double, it's going to be problematic. Yes, possible neighbor is a function. The function is defined here. Yes. It's defined here. Yeah. So I think for now, don't just don't worry about the implementation of possible neighbors. Just remember that possible neighbors returns the list of possible neighbors. I think that's the beauty of coding as well. You don't really need to understand what's happening under the hood. You just need to know, oh yeah, possible neighbors is gonna give me all the possible list of uh, the list of all possible neighbors. Now uh, we have gotten the new position in not vis not been visited, right? Uh, we add them up. And then after it's done, you repeat. You from position, from the bucket list, you take one out. As pop is meaning that you just take one item out from the list. Regarding the implementation of as pop, I strongly recommend you guys to Google what a uh, position is being taken out. Is it the first item? Is it the last item? Is it a random item inside the list? Go look it up. I'm not gonna tell you here. Take another position, take another coordinate, check whether that coordinate is the in desired coordinate. If it's not, keep on getting all the neighbors. And at a certain point, right, this S will run out, will be empty. And if we have already explored all possible places and we still cannot find the place, then we simply return false. Was I talking too fast again? Or you guys still need, you guys need me to explain again? It's okay. Okay, okay, processing. Take, take, take your time, take your time. Okay, for the rest of you, right, if you guys are already okay and you guys have no more questions, uh, feel free to leave the tutorial. I'm not gonna hold you guys back. Uh, yeah, we're already done here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you guys have a nice day. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi, Andy. Oh, okay. Sorry, but uh, look at the code, but I don't understand why if new position not in visited, uh, you append the new position to visited. Okay, so I think there's a different 
implementation to uh, different implementation on this is that uh, unlike unlike our, my initial simulation where we only appended to visit that when we actually have visited it in this question right it assumes that since eventually right eventually the place will be visited right eventually right the neighbors that the possible positions that we add to our bucket list will be eventually visited so um, the code just simply immediately added to visit it will simply just add it to visit it and assumes that oh yeah we're gonna visit it anyways hence it's appended to visit it oh, so that okay. so that when you are trying to add new coordinates right you can you can simply just check and visit it because uh, the list visited right contains places that you have visited and you are going to visit as well. So S pop only removed the last uh, coordinates though. Um, that one I kind of forgot that. I think so. I think so. But that one you kind of need to figure out on your. You can Google it up uh, on the implementation. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop recording here.